Welcome back to my series on chess opening theory. In this video, I'm going to be taking a look at the c4 sideline in the exchange variation of the French defense. So the French defense is when we have the moves e4, e6, d4, d5, and the exchange variation is when white now plays e takes d5 and black plays e takes d5. So the line I'm going to be looking at today is pawn to c4. But this is in actuality a sideline as the moves knight to f3 and bishop to d3 are significantly more popular. And in fact, it's actually very unlikely that you will see this move pawn to c4 be played in this position as generally when white plays the exchange variation they're very happy with a draw whereas the move pawn to c4 kind of takes on a fair amount of risk as white is generally going to be left with an isolated queen pawn which is going to be you know very interesting very double-edged as while the isolated queen pawn would not have any neighboring pawns that can defend it at the same time, the files surrounding it, as well as the, oops, sorry, the diagonals of the square right in front of it can very often be used for attacking. Attacking isolated pawns are very double-edged and very interesting. And as a result, since they are interesting, you're unlikely to actually see, it, see this position from a normal exchange variation move order. Instead, this position is much more commonly seen from other move orders. For example, e4, e6, c4, d5, and if white wants to play the orthonschnapp gambit, white could play c takes d5, e takes d5, and then queen b3. And I might cover this line in the week where I take a look at sidelines, as, you know, it, it's kind of a funny little line, but um, if white instead chooses to take with the e-pawn and black takes back with uh, their pawn, as you know, that's the most intuitive move, move, then the most common move for white in this position is to play pawn to d4, as white probably doesn't want black putting their own pawn on d4. And we would have the position from before. Yet another way in which the position can be encountered is if white plays the English opening, black plays e6, white plays e4, black plays d5, takes, takes, you know, same thing. So as a result, well, it's this line, you know, coming from an exchange variation move order, is not one that I think, uh, you should usually worry that much about. It is pretty interesting, and it is certainly worth covering, but um, I, I consider this to just be a sideline. And there are not that many games in the database that feature it. It's, so, I did manage to find two very interesting games, though. Oh, and I'm going to cover them both in this video, as as I'm worried that if I did two separate videos, those then my audience, so you all, would get the wrong idea that this line, this sideline, is more important than it actually is. So one video will be sufficient, and, and the two games in question are fairly short anyway. I'm going to put some timestamps in the video description, or chapters if you prefer, like using the... Uh, uh, seek, seeking control in the video player here and um, and uh, yeah so for the first game with the white pieces we have Grandmaster uh, Luis Manuel uh, Perez Rodriguez uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly he is a Grandmaster from Cuba and uh, that's all I know about him that's all the information that I could find I am very disappointed in myself. Uh, anyway, if you do happen to know more information about White, 
then feel free to leave a comment on the video, just, you know, telling me some more about them, them, or pointing me to a good resource. And with the black pieces, we have Grandmaster Surya Shikar Ganguly, and he is a Grandmaster from India. And he is a player who has had a lot of success. He's won, won a number of uh, prestigious events in uh, both nat nationally, both in India as well as internationally. He like both individual events as well as team events, playing on the Olympiad, stuff like that, as well as winning, winning the Indian National Championship six years in a row. Oh, so very cool stuff. He was also a, like he's also a second for uh, Vichy Anand back when Anand was, you know, world champion. And, and uh, most importantly for us, he is a very well-known practitioner of the French defense. So I'm very likely going to be covering um, at least one other of his games. So I'm looking forward to when I do that. And I'm also looking forward to talking about this game. And so this particular game was a uh, Blitz game. And it was a, a uh, titled Tuesday a game. So in September 15th of 2020, so fairly recent. And more information about the players and the events can be found in the video description and also maybe the comments of this video. So without further ado, let's get to the game. So white has just played the move pawn to c4, putting some pressure on black's pawn on d5. So black now played the move knight to f6, which is a very good move against, you know, just about anything that white might play against you in the exchange variation. In this case, He's, this move happens to not just develop the knight to one of its best squares, but it also happens to give black the option of taking back on d5 with the knight should that need arise, as very often against isolated pawns, very often you want to blockade them, and knights are especially good, good for that task. Anyway, white played the most common move, which is knight to c3 adding some more pressure to the d5 pawn, as well as the d5 square in general. And black played bishop to b4, just getting ready to castle kingside, developing the bishop to an excellent square, and, you know, taking away some of white's pressure on that, on the pawn, on d5. White now plays bishop to d3, which, um does kind of block the queen from the defense of the d4 square, but nothing is yet attacking it. And the purpose of bishop d3 is white wants to develop their knight to e2, where it will defend this knight, so potentially giving white the option to take back with the knight if they want that, and also defend the pawn. Uh, knight to f3 has also been played, okay, but knight e2 is most common. So black now played d takes c4, essentially laughing at the bishop on d3, saying, ha ha, you, you moved your bishop, you have to move it again, you have to waste a move. White takes back, black castles, white now plays knight e2, black plays knight bd7, getting ready to, you know, do something cool with this knight, white castles. Black plays knight b6, hitting the bishop on c4, white plays bishop b3, and black now plays pawn to c6, and we now see the true purpose of black putting the knight on b6, which is to help fight for control of the d5 square. White plays bishop to g5, fighting for control of this square indirectly by pinning the knight. Black plays h6. Questioning the bishop, basically asking, you know, what white's true intentions with this bishop are before continuing. Like, does white want to trade this bishop for the knight? Does white actually want this bishop on a different square? Or does white really want to maintain this pin? So white reveals that they really want to maintain this, maintain this pin. Black plays bishop to e7, as the bishop wasn't really doing much on b4 anymore. White's move knight e2 kind of, you know, repels that in a way, 
kind of deals with that. So the bishop is now doing something more important on the e7 square. Back play, sorry, white plays bishop to g3. The engine doesn't like this move. The engine would have preferred if white developed another piece, in particular the rook coming to e1. Black now develops their rook with rook to e8. White plays bishop to c2, and I don't really like this move myself, as I think this bishop was very well placed on b3, where it was not only fighting for control of the d5 square, but it was also pinning the f7 pawn to the king, so maybe potentially white could have made use of the g6 square. Like, maybe white could have done something interesting like knight f4, knight g6, for example. I don't know. I don't know if that's necessarily a good idea, but it would have act, it would have at least been interesting. And like I don't like the bishop on c2. I don't really see much purpose of it being there. Maybe the point is to take away the f5 square from this bishop. But this is blitz, so you know not all the moves are going to necessarily make sense or be accurate. So black plays bishop to e6, and I do quite like this move as I think this diagonal is very good for this bishop. It helps fight for control of the d5 square, which is very important. White plays knight to f4, hitting this bishop, but black just puts the bishop on c4, hitting the rook. White plays rook e1. Black plays queen d7, getting ready to bring the rook, bring the other rook into the game. Still fight for control of this square. White plays queen d2, black plays rook a d8, white plays rook a d1, black plays bishop f8, seeing that the bishop has kind of, again, fulfilled its duty on e7. This bishop is no longer on this diagonal, you know, no longer doing its pin, and if it came back to this diagonal, that would not be a good idea, as black can just win some material here. Black's not too afraid if white tries, you know, like blasting things open over here as black has plenty of pieces. Black can, you know, block with bishop g7, bring the knight back to h7 if need, need be. So black's not that scared of pushing the pawns in front of their king. That's not what happened in the game. White played pawn to b3, questioning this bishop, asking what its, you know, purpose is, what black wants to do with it. And Black answered that question, saying that the purpose of this bishop is to occupy this nice diagonal, is to help restrict White's pieces. This is White plays knight to e4, and I feel that this trade is actually fairly good for Black, as Black now has the move pawn to g6, preparing not only the move bishop g7, which would bring this bishop back into the game, but also the move pawn to f5. Pawn to f5 was not possible before with the knight in the way. And the bishop is less good on g7 if the knight is in the way. Okay, so I think this trade mostly benefited black. White plays pawn to f3. Somewhere in the, in the distance, Ben Feingold is screaming. And let's see. Pawn to f3 I think is a very strange move. Maybe part of the idea might have been to bring this bishop back to f2, as this bishop is very awkward over here when it's being blocked by this knight. Right, but one downside of pawn to f3 is it does take away the f3 square from this bishop on e4. So I don't like it that much. I feel that this bishop is kind of move. This dark square bishop is just kind of moving around too much. It's it's kind of a strange piece. And so black just plays bishop to g7. This bishop finds, you know, a new purpose, hitting this pawn over here. White decided to push the pawn, playing pawn to d5. This was probably premature. Like, I do not think that pawn to d5 was a good move, even though the engine doesn't mark it as an inaccuracy or anything like that. Uh, black now plays c takes d5. White plays knight takes d5. And black plays pawn to f5. And if you want, you can now pause the video and try to figure out what white should do next. Next. I will reveal the answer in 3, 2, 1. So, in this position, if you said that white should now play bishop takes f5, 
then congratulations, you are thinking like a Grandmaster. Unfortunately, you are thinking like the Grandmaster who lost that game. So, you know, that's not so good. Yeah, the game ended with Black playing G takes F5, and Black is now just up a piece. White played Rook takes E8, Black played Rook takes E8, and maybe White thought that they had the move Knight F6 check, and Black would take, but turns out that this Queen is defended by this Knight, so Knight F6 check would not work. Black would just go into the endgame being up a bishop, being up this bishop. So, back in this position over here, instead of playing bishop takes f5, a better try for white, right? And it's it's understandable that white might, uh, you know, misevaluate or hallucinate certain tactics, stuff like that, as this is blitz. This, that stuff tends to happen very frequently. But a better try for white would have been knight takes b6. Uh, after that, black should play queen takes d2. As otherwise, if black, say, takes the knight or takes the bishop, so takes like this, then white can win a rook over here and basically be up in exchange after black plays, you know, after black takes this. Like, it doesn't uh, matter which way... You know, black takes, if black takes this bishop first or takes the knight first, white would play these same set of moves. moves, and white would just be up in exchange here. So as a result, best move for black would be to just take the queen, and after uh, white, white takes back, back, um, let's see, uh, best move for black, back, there are some important tricks here, of course. Of course, like if uh, black now goes rook takes d2, this isn't so great because white can play, you know, bishop here, check, and then take this rook. Okay, and if and of course, if the king comes over here, that's a very bad idea because, uh, you know, king's just going to get attacked, all that kind of nasty stuff. Oh, so as a result, it's best better for black to instead just take like this. And then white wants to do this rook trade for two reasons. One is that this rook and this knight are both under attack at the same time. Another reason, of course, is that white does not want this pawn coming forward. So white would trade rooks. And then white would save their knight. And in this position, black should bail out with the pawns. And this is where I'm going to just stop the analysis as... As this is just an interesting endgame where, or objectively, believe that black is just very slightly better. Better like if anybody has winning chances here, it would be black. But there's still a game to be played, and the reason why black is slightly better here, here is because black has the bishop pair, and also black's pawn structure is a little bit better as. You know, these pawns are both isolated. They're a bit harder for white to defend. But there would still be a game to be played here. Here, So that's why I, knight takes b6 was a much better try than uh, bishop takes f5, which was most likely just a hallucination. You know, something like that. So anyway, I hope that you enjoyed this game. I'm going to now go for a quick break and then start talking about the second game. Welcome back to my series on chess opening theory. In this video, I'm going to... Wait a minute, didn't I already say all this? I'm having some very serious deja vu. Uh, anyway, uh, in this game we have the c4 sideline in the exchange variation of the French defense. And with the white pieces, we have international master Marinus Kujif. Uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. He is an I am from the Netherlands, and he, ha he has won the uh, uh, Dutch Chess Championship back, back in 1989, and he was also a uh, 
bronze medalist in the chess olympiad and he also you know had some success in international tournaments as well including Wai Ponze way back in the day and with the black pieces we have grandmaster Victor Korsnoy who is one of the greatest French defense players of all time and the reason why I say that is because he is one of the greatest players of all time but he was very well known for playing the French and like many people would say he was the greatest player to never become world champion and I would certainly agree with that but I would also say that uh, Grandmaster Korsnoy was probably stronger than a lot of players who did become world champion because with a lot of them they would become world champion once and then never again like they would often never even really get all that close ever again whereas Grandmaster Korsnoy oh man he he was very impressive like he was very often the world champion challenger decade after decade after decade that's that's crazy in my opinion that's really really strong and so anyway sadly grandmaster Korsnoy is no longer with with us he uh, passed away a bit over a decade ago but we still have many great games by him to look at and this particular game was played at the Tilburg Tournament in 1992. And uh, let's uh, get to the game. So, as before, in this position, Black played the move Knight to F6. This is just a great move to play against just about anything in the exchange variation. And in this case, as I mentioned before, Part of the reason is to give black the option of taking back on d5 with the knight. White plays knight to c3. Black plays bishop to b4. And in this position, white now took the pawn. And this is a very rare move. This is not a move that is seen very often. And I think there's a very good reason why. I think this game is the reason why. They think Grandmasters saw this game and were like, oh, yeah, okay, <laughs> we're not going to play like that. We don't like what happened here. So, uh, before continuing, I thought I should just very briefly mention that um, if white plays the move bishop to g5, the best move for black is to not actually worry about this pawn, since basically black wants to get ahead in, de in development. And it's like here... In this position, if white goes pawn grubbing, like saying bishop takes knight, queen takes bishop, and then takes this pawn. If you want, you can now pause the video and try to find a really strong move for black. Like, there are many good moves for black here, since black is just ahead in development, and these pawns are probably going to fall. Uh, but there's one move here that is quite a bit better than the others. So I will reveal the move in 3, 2, 1. The move would be the move on to c5, which is just a very nasty move. As it strikes in the center, you know, it tries to open things up even more. This king looks very silly. And basically, if white takes, this would be a very embarrassing way for the game to end. As basically, white has to play queen d2 here and give up their rook. If white plays king e2, then whoops, that would be checkmate. Eight. And, of course, back in this position, the best move for white is to play a d takes c5. You know, deal with some of this pressure. But part of the problem with that, of course, is just that look at how many pieces black has in the game. Or just look at how many pieces white would have in the game. But this is not what happened in the game. This is not what happened in the game. I just thought I should mention... You know what to do against bishop g5 the book where i originally got this game came from also mentions it's that book being the french defense move by move by grandmaster damien namos and i thought yeah that's that's a very cool thing to mention just how you know black should be prioritizing just getting ahead in development and and then not worrying too much about pawns as king safety is much more important than material Anyway, so white now played pawn takes d5, and black took back with the knight. 
Knight. This is just a really good square for the Knight to be. Just right in front of the isolated pawn, blockading it and blocking the diagonals surrounding the pawn. And also adding some pressure to this Knight over here. So overall, just very nice square for this Knight to be. White now played Bishop to d2. Black castle kingside. White plays Bishop to d3. Another very quick thing to just mention is that if white plays bishop to c4, trying to harass this knight, trying to get it out of here, black would just play knight to b6, hitting the bishop and also hitting this pawn. So bishop to c4 would just drop the d4 pawn. So that's why bishop to d3 was played. And in this position, black has a very nice move, just pawn to c5, striking at the center, like, like we mentioned before, in that other potential line that could happen. And in this position, this is where white really starts to go wrong. White starts pawn grubbing. White's like, ooh, free pawn, yummy, yummy, yummy. But, uh, uh, we, I, I'm going to kind of forgive white since this is an old game, but we're kind of, like, over time, I, we kind of learned the value, we learned more the value of king safety and peace activity. Like, white really should just be going 92 and just, just castling. White does not have time to be grabbing pawns. Like, black doesn't even take back immediately. Black takes this. Just getting rid of the defenses surrounding white's king. As black wants to now attack. Now here, the move that black played is okay. The move that black played was knight d7. And this is the second best move. But if you want, you can pause the video and see if you can find the best move for black to play in this position. As, you know, black can get fairly aggressive here. I will reveal the move in 3, 2, 1. So the best move for black is to just play queen g5. Just getting aggressive, hitting these two pawns. And then, after white plays queen f3, then black could play knight d7. And, you know, white would probably play bishop c2 because the knight was coming to e5 where it would fork the queen and bishop. That could now take this pawn. And this is just a very pleasant position for black. A sample continuation would be something like knight e2, bishop to g4, or the queen has to come to e3 because otherwise one of these rooks, probably this one, would come to e8 and just stop white from castling forever. Black is happy to do this queen trade as white's pawn structure is just awful. Just terrible pawn structure. Black would play rook f8, just develop the rook, put pressure on the pawn. White really has only one way to save it, which is with the king. Black could play rook e5 and just double up. And white would play knight d4. Now this is just a sample line. This is what could have happened if black played queen g5. And overall, I would say black is quite a bit better here. They're like black's doing very well, just much more active pieces, much better pawn structure. Black is very happy. But that's not what happened in the game. Instead, black played knight d7, which is a fine move, just trying to develop this knight. White plays pawn to c6, you know, trying to maybe damage black's pawn structure a bit. But white really needs to castle. So black plays knight c5, black does not play knight e5 as black might want to use this file for their rook, so knight c5 makes a fair amount of sense. White uh, does not want to lose their bishop, which is currently under attack. White plays bishop to c2. Black plays rook e8 with check. White plays knight e2. And black plays queen e7 saying, oh no, 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 you're not castling. No castling for you. If white now castles, then, ooh, a free knight. That's better than a pawn. Um, I want that. Yum, yum. So instead, white doesn't really have a way of adding an additional defender to this knight. Right? Like, it would just be way too slow. So white instead breaks the pin with the move king to f1. But this basically forever surrenders castling rights. Black now takes this pawn as black is getting ready to develop their bishop. White plays knight to d4. Black plays knight to e4. 
know, improving the position of the knight and also targeting this pawn and also potentially targeting this pawn as well. White plays knight takes c6. Now grabbing more pawns. I I guess white figures, well, well, I'm pretty, pretty worse on the board here. I might as well just try to grab pawns and maybe I can somehow get a win from that. That plays bishop to a6 check, which is not the best move according to the engine, but honestly, the difference between minus 5 and minus 3, it's not really that big. It's basically just winning and still winning. Like, the best move according to the engine is queen to c7, but it's actually very tricky to see why. So, I'm not even going to go into why queen to c7 is better. Because it doesn't really matter. Bishop to a6 check is more intuitive and is fine. White plays king g1 because king going to the king going to e1 would be suicide. Black plays queen c5, attacking the knight and attacking the pawn, and also improving the position of the queen, and in particular attacking this pawn. Things are getting quite nasty here. So white has to bail out and trade. Trade their bishop for the knight. Right. And here, in this position, white played the move knight to b4, but they should have played knight to d4 because this knight belongs on f3. In general, f3 is a very good square for the knight to be as a defensive resource when you've got a king that's castled on the king side, or in this case, king on g1. The reason why, that, like in this particular case, is the reason why the knight is very good on f3 is because it will defend the e1 square, which is going to be a target that black is going to be going after. But instead, white played knight to b4, and, you know, white is attacking black's bishop, but black doesn't care. Black's like, yeah, you can, you can have that bishop, it doesn't matter. I care more about, you know, peace activity and, uh, you know, king safety. He... White takes the bishop, black takes the pawn, threatening rook e1, which would not just win material, but it would also be checkmate. So white has only one move that gets out of both threats, which is king to f1. Black plays queen c4 check, white goes back, only move that white really has, and black takes the knight, and this move is okay. It's, but it's not the best move. It's not the best way that Black could have continued. Dude, according to the engine, a better approach, a much better approach, is to play Rook E2 with the idea of putting the Queen on B2 and, you know, basically going for checkmate. Like, White is up at night, but the Knight is kind of useless. It's all the way over here where it can't really do anything. And so White would most likely play Rook B1 here. Black could play rook, rook d2. White could play queen f3. Black plays queen c2, hitting the rook, and also lining up the queen with this rook. Would have rook a1, and then rook d3. And then there isn't really a nice way for white to keep everything together, as basically these threats are just very, very nasty. Like, um, for example, if uh, white did try, like, maybe queen h5 or queen g4, something like that, that then, and black in this position is going to check really quick. That could just continue with queen b2, and there isn't really a nice square for this rook to go to. So, like, white could try maybe rook d1. But then there's a really, really cool move by black, which is queen b5. And this basically threatens to win the rook with discovered check. Also threatens the queen. And there isn't really any nice way for white to keep everything together here. Here, like, white basically has to give up their queen. But this is not what happened in the game, and it is very hard to see this far ahead. So I don't really blame back for missing like this potential sequence another thing that could happen way back in this position is white could play knight b4 
And Black could just play Queen C3 and just, you know, laugh at, you know, the Knight and the Queen. And basically, Black is threatening to win the Rook and to win in the Queen. So, anyway. He, um, oh, what's it called? Back in this position, Black played Queen C4 check. We played King G1. Black took the Knight, just keeping things simple. Oh, like, even... Even Super Grandmasters, even they will often try to avoid things getting too complicated. Like in this position, Black knows that they are better, that they can still play for a win, that White doesn't really have much counterplay here. here. Whereas in the other position, there's always a chance that Black messes something up. So anyway, in this position, White makes some luck with the move on to G3. He and the engine would have preferred pawn to h4, hiding the king, like trying to hide the king on h2. Which, you know, make, does make some sense. But it's still a difficult position for white to play. Black plays rook e2, putting this rook on the 7th rank, where it is very strong. White plays queen d7, you know, going for some active counterplay. You know, hitting this rook, kind of tying this rook down to the defense of this rook. And here, black plays queen f6. Targeting both this rook and this pawn, but the engine seems to prefer queen b6 instead. And, and my guess is that with queen b6, black would be forever pinning this pawn to the king, so this pawn would not be ever coming forward. Like if the king comes to g2, the pawn is still pinned. And, but queen f6 is more intuitive because black is planning to put their queen on the f3 square. There. White plays rook f1, and black plays queen f3. Sadly, this move is kind of the wrong way of going about the attack, as it doesn't really do all that much. All it really does is just restrict the king from coming to the g2 square. But white can just play a h4, followed by king h2 at some point. Right, and basically solve white's one big problem, which is getting this rook out. Like, white can't really do that right away. Hey, like, uh, white can't play king h2 right away because white does need to defend this pawn. But white can defend that pawn by using the queen, by putting it on this diagonal. But basically, in this position, white really needs to prioritize playing h4, and we're going to now see why. Alright, in this position, white played queen takes a7, which was probably the losing move. This was probably the move that lost the game. Black now plays his rook to e1. White plays queen to a6. Like basically, if white now tried pawn to h4, oh, sorry. If white now tried pawn to h4, then this would just lose on the spot to rook takes f1 check. If king h2, then something taking on h1 would be mate. And if king h1, then queen takes h1 would be mate. Okay, so as a result, queen takes a7 was the losing move. Black plays rook e1. White plays queen a6, defending against that threat of rook takes rook, king takes, and then queen takes this rook. And if you want, you can pause the video and try to see how black should continue their attack. I will reveal the move in 3, 2, 1. So, the way for black to continue the attack is by just making some luft. In particular, playing pawn to h5 is just a great way to do that, as black wants to bring this rook into the attack. So, white now played pawn to h4. Black brings this rook to e2, and black is threatening to play queen takes f2 checkmate. So... White doesn't really have any nice way out of this. It's like, according to the engine, White should just sacrifice their queen for the rook. And that would still be losing. But instead, White played queen a7. Black plays rook takes rook. White takes back with the king. And black plays rook b2. And there is no nice way for White to stop checkmate. It's... Like, there are these two nasty threats, white cannot deal with both of them, so white just resigned. Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed both of these games. Uh, thank you, and bye for now.